All right, perfect. Steve, can you see that? I can. All right, awesome. I haven't forgotten how to use Zoom, which is good. <laughs> All right, good evening, everybody. As Steve said, my name is uh, Scott Bjorklund. I'm a park ranger with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, here in Duluth, Minnesota. And as you said, today I'm going to be talking a little bit on, well, not just a little bit, for a good 45 minutes or so on the history of the uh, Duluth Ship Canal, which is where a lot of the vessels that come into our port come and go from. Uh, it's the major entrance into uh, Duluth Superior Harbor here. So although it doesn't look like a very major, huge structure um, compared to, let's say, the Welland Canal, uh, closer to you guys where we have, you know, miles and miles worth of channel with locks. Um, it's a very pe important piece of uh, navigational structure um, here on Lake Superior just because of how important um, the shipping is that comes in and out of Duluth Superior here. A little bit of an outline on what we're going to be talking about as we go through. I'll give you guys a little bit of an introduction to where I'm from here, Duluth, and uh, if you don't know what the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, what we are as an organization and what we do. Uh, there's some information there. Uh, some information um, before the ship canal was built, so uh, a little bit on why people moved to this area and why shipping was developed here. A little bit on the railroads. Uh, Jay Cook, who was a major uh, millionaire who uh, put in a lot of money into developing the port here. Wheat and, of course, Lake Superior. The building of the canal, um, there was actually a famous uh, fight that went on between our city and Superior next door over the creation of this canal, which is a good portion of the presentation. And then finally, um, when the Corps of Engineers actually took over the canal and improvements have been made up to it. All right, so some of you might be wondering where the heck is Duluth. Um, I just kind of went on Google Maps quick just to see how far away I am from you guys. And uh, according to Google Maps, I'm about uh, 647 miles away, uh, straight there, so just over 1,000 kilometers. Um, and I actually looked up the driving time. I would take about 16 hours to drive there, so Zoom is kind of amazing. I don't have to do that to uh, visit you guys to do a presentation. That would have been a long drive. It would have been really cool, though. <laughs> um, but I'm on, all the way on the western side of Lake Superior. We're at the very end of the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, so we're kind of an important uh, port here for various reasons. Uh, a little bit on the Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center where I come from. Uh, we focus on Great Lakes shipping as well as um, the Corps of Engineers role in our nations. Uh, in the United States, we have a big part in water infrastructure and uh, we're just big about education on Lake Superior and uh, history. So uh, we actually have, like your guys' event tonight, we have our own version called the Virtual Visitor Center that we run. So um, there's a couple of links that you can see there. So if you're interested and like what you see from me, we do tons more. Um, we do a presentation once a month um, where we have speakers from around the Great Lakes, uh, like me, talking about shipping and uh, other historical things. So we also have a partnership with the Sioux Locks visitor center if anyone's ever been to the Sioux Locks. It's on the other side of Lake Superior. So uh, that's a Corps of Engineers visitor center as well. Then there's the uh, there's our place right next to the aerial lift bridge in Duluth. So what the heck is the Army Corps of Engineers? I've never heard of it, uh, is, which is probably what you might be wondering. Um, a lot of people here in the U.S. haven't heard of the engineers before, but um, we are a section of the U.S. Army uh, that is heavily involved with uh, military and civilian engineering and construction throughout the country. Um, it's mostly civilian based, but we, uh, I, I work for the Army as a civilian. I'm not a military member. Um, there's about 37,000 of us worldwide. Um, and we're mostly here on the Great Lakes involved with dredging uh, in the harbors and channels, uh, water infrastructure, like I said. And since the Corps uh, oversees all the waterways, we actually own a lot of land, public land. So um, they need people like me, park rangers, to um, kind of run and oversee recreational areas. So if you're wondering, <laughs> the park ranger, Army Corps of Engineers doesn't make any sense. Just kind of see me as like a national park ranger or a provincial park ranger like you guys probably have. Um, all right, a little bit of basics on our harbor, if you're not aware. Um, 
we ship a ton of cargo here um, all the way on the western side of Lake Superior that goes all the way through the St. Lawrence Seaway. Most of it stays uh, here in the U.S., but there's a bunch of it that goes over to Canada and overseas. Um, we had 32.8 million tons of cargo go through uh, last shipping season, and we had 718 vessel visits. So um, we actually have the same, we have a number of vessels that visit us, uh, you know, up to 40 times a season going back and forth just across the Great Lakes. Um, but we also had 50 overseas uh, international vessels. Um, we are the busiest harbor on the Great Lakes, not necessarily the busiest on the seaway. I believe Montreal or Quebec City would be the busiest, but we're the busiest on the American side of the Great Lakes. So, and we're the 26th busiest in the entire country, which is huge. Um, we're one of the top ports for just dry pulp cargo, which is um, iron ore, uh, wheat, coal. Um, iron ore makes up the bulk of what we ship out of here. And we're the furthest inland seaport in the world uh, with our connection to the St. Lawrence Seaway. So uh, for folks, since um, a lot of you probably haven't been to Duluth um, or even heard of it, which is totally okay, so you can kind of disregard this slide, but uh, this is the part of the presentation where I ask folks who've been to Duluth, what do they think of um, for those that have been here? Um, so I'll kind of go through this real quickly. You might think of the outdoors. Uh, we have an amazing amount of parks, not just here in the city, but Along uh, Lake Superior, we have some amazing state parks. So a lot of people kind of think of the outdoors when they come up here. Um, a lot of people think about Lake Superior. Um, the Lake Superior is the largest of the Great Lakes. Um, and it's just, some, it's, it's hard to describe. Uh, for, it's, it's the largest uh, freshwater lake in the world by surface area. Um, lake Bacall in Siberia is the deepest, but we're the biggest by surface area. You can fit all the other Great Lakes um, into Lake Superior and they still have extra. It's just amazing. Um, you might be thinking of shipping, which we'll get into a little bit today. Uh, there's the John G. Munson, one of the classic American freighters that comes in. Uh, a lot of people visit our visitor center just to see the ships because we're right next to the Duluth Ship Canal. Or you might think of the area lift bridge. A lot of people, when I ask them if they've been to Duluth, they'll say that they remember this thing. Uh, this is kind of the symbol of the city. Um, if you ever see our hockey teams or anything related to Duluth, we you, the aerial lift bridge is a symbol um, for our location because it's a really unique bridge. There's um, there's various lift bridges around you know the country, but this is the only one of this particular design. So it's huge um, to allow ships to come through. But what I'm here to argue today is what we should be thinking about when we think of Duluth. Um, as its identity is the Duluth Ship Canal. And like I said, that's where our visitor center is located. That's what the Duluth area lift bridge goes over. Um, that gets to the other uh, side of it where people live. And it's the center of Duluth's identity for a lot of different reasons that we'll be talking about today. I'll come back to this theme towards the end. But this is where the ships come in and out of the harbor. They come in from the lake and they can exit. Um, the canal itself is about 300 feet wide, so only one ship, one large commercial ship at a time, but this is kind of the linchpin for all shipping um, here, um, for a lot of American shipping on the Great Lakes in general, since we're one of the, we're the busiest port on the Great Lakes. So, so now I'll take you all back 150 years ago. So the canal just celebrated its 150th year um, last year for being finished. Um, so it goes all the way back to the early 1870s, and uh, it is man-made. It wasn't a natural canal that already existed. In fact, uh, if you look at this picture here, this is what the Duluth area looked like in 1869. Um, it was pretty, um, there wasn't a whole lot of population here. Even uh, the native communities of Ojibwe and Anishinaabe, um, there weren't as very many of them around either. Um, there were a few European settlers here and there. It was a pretty... Um, not very well developed place back in the day. And the Duluth Ship Canal uh, would have been about there in that picture. Um, but as you can see, this is wilderness. Um, there were a lot of early uh, pioneer families did live on this um, point, which is called Minnesota Point. It's a long sandy peninsula that kind of guards the harbor area um, from the lake. 
And this is what it looks like today, which is a huge difference. You can see this is the area called Canal Park right next to the Duluth Ship Canal. And that's where the aerial lift bridge was. So it be, kind of became a huge place um, for um, development over the years. And now it's a huge tourist area. If any of you have been to Duluth, it's a, one of the major areas you visit if you're coming here to, as a visitor. And that's where a visitor center is. So a lot of differences there. So a little overview of what the harbor looked like um, before any work was done on dredging and that sort of thing. Um, it was, it, we're one of the larger harbors you can find on the Great Lakes. We have 18 miles worth of channels alone for the ships. So the, the peninsula that you can see, Minnesota Point, as I pointed out, between uh, where the Monarch Canal was built all the way down. Actually, you know what? I forgot. I can use pointer options. Aha, forgot about this. So if you're looking all the way up here where the Monner Canal is today, all the way down to the, uh, this is called the Superior Entry, where the St. Louis River, uh, which you can see here, this is where it exits into Lake Superior. This peninsula is about um, seven, seven-ish miles long. It's one of the longest sandbars uh, and fresh water you can find in the world. So it's a really cool, unique uh, sandbar. But the way it developed was over hundreds of years, water would come down the St. Louis River and the waters from Lake Superior would counteract against that and that created the sandy bar um, over time. And that's how this peninsula was also created. So, and this gave a whole bunch of space um, here in our harbor area. Um, a lot of the Great Lakes harbors are based off of rivers like this, but this ours is uniquely huge uh, because of um, with the large uh, St. Louis River that runs through it. And again, there's that natural entry. Um, back in the day, you could only get in, out, in and out of the harbor um, at the entrance here where the St. Louis River exits into the lake. And uh, the canal uh, that was eventually built was actually built in one of the uh, spots on Minnesota Point that that was wasn't as wide. It was actually used as a canoe portage for uh, hundreds of years by the Ojibwe. Um, so it makes sense that they decided to build a canal there um, in the future. So a little bit on how shipping even developed here in the first place. Um, so what brought a lot of Europeans to the area was uh, mineral exploration. In the 1840s, there was a lot of copper and iron ore that was discovered um, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So that brought a lot of settlers up north here. Um, another thing that brought them here was the Treaty of La Pointe, which was signed, uh, that signed over um, the land to um, the United States <clears throat> by the local Ojibwe. And then the building of the Sioux Locks was a huge factor in the development of shipping uh, here at Duluth and Superior. And you can see a picture. This is the early Sioux Locks that was built in 1855 at Sault Ste. Marie, which is on the right hand uh, side of the lake. Um, the locks had to be built because there's a 20 feet uh, difference uh, between Lake Superior and the rest uh, Lake Huron and Lake Michigan. So without a canal and or without the Sioux Locks there, ships wouldn't be able to easily get into Lake Superior. After that was done, the whole lake was open to the rest of the world basically for shipping at that point. Duluth's namesake, a little bit on the background here of where our name came from. It's uh, from a French explorer um, who was here in the seven, 1670s. Um, who was here basically trying to get a treaty signed between the Ojibwe and the Dakota natives here uh, that were in constant conflict. Uh, he wanted a peace treaty signed so that the French could have better access for uh, the fur trade. And uh, he famously, and according to legend, crossed um, the Duluth Ship Canal where it is today um, at the Low Portage is where he arrived uh, here in our area. Do we know if that happened for sure? Not really. Uh, it's just a famous legend that everyone talks about. We know for sure he came through here. We just don't know exactly where he was since this was 1679 and Minnesota would not be very well um, settled until the 1850s, uh, 60s, and 70s. So, And here's a famous painting of that um, where, when he landed on Minnesota Point. 
So interestingly enough, um, with uh, the kind of the development of the Sioux locks and shipping that began to come over from uh, the other part of the Great Lakes, uh, there was actually a huge population boom at first on both sides of our harbor. And uh, there was an early um, thought to building a canal here in the 1850s, way before it actually happened, um, to develop shipping further. Um, and I have this old map here to kind of show that um, they actually had a, um, this is where on Minnesota Point where the, they had a street called Portage Street, which is where the canal was going to be planned out. Um, there was a company founded in 1857 to look into uh, building the canal so that ships had better access to the Minnesota side of the harbor. Because at the time there was only access, easy access to the superior side. Well, due to a financial panic or what we would call today a um, recession, uh, that sapped up all the investments that were made into the area. So that drove down the population. Um, and as you can see, we went down from 2000 settlers in 1857 all the way down to 14 families by the 1860s. So a little bit of background there, but the idea for the canal didn't go away. Um, it would soon um, come back. And what drove that idea coming back was the railroads that were being built uh, here in Minnesota. So railroads um, with the expansion of uh, Europeans and other um, others that came over to the U.S. going west. Railroads were a big part of the progress in the expansion of business and cities that were being built. So they were key. Uh, every city that was trying to develop anything uh, wanted a railroad being built to them so that they could have um, access to the whole network across the country. Um, so at the time, what would happen was uh, states would give out uh, state governments would give out land grants where public land would be given to railroads to help fund the, the construction, kind of like a subsidy kind of thing. So both Duluth and Superior, unsurprisingly, fought for land grants in the 1850s. Basically, both sides of the harbor from the different states were saying they wanted a railroad to their location so they could help um, develop shipping there. Um, out of the uh, two cities that fought for a railroad, Duluth won, uh, surprisingly. Um, they were able to get the Minnesota legislature to uh, give out a land grant to the Lake Superior Mississippi Railroad, which was started in St. Paul, uh, south of us on the Mississippi, uh, which began construction in 1863. And uh, this photo you see on the right here is the first uh, freight depot that was built here when the railroad arrived here in the in 1870. <clears throat> Excuse me. But unfortunately, due to the uh, U.S. Civil War that was going on and the rugged terrain, um, and the just the fact how unsettled the area was, they it was construction was very slow. In fact, uh, the the railroad almost went bankrupt. Um, as they were um, just because of how, um, excuse me, how expensive construction was getting it up from St. Paul to Duluth. That's about, I believe it's about 100 to 200 miles. So it's a, it's a long ways of rugged terrain that they had to build the railroad through. Another thing that led to the building of the canal in 1870 was demand for wheat. So a lot of the development that was happening here in our region was uh, mainly focused on uh, developing wheat farming so that that um, farmland could be used to grow wheat and send it east uh, to the more populated side of the U.S. And it was a huge business then. Um, it was figured out, the reason why the railroad was going to be built up to Duluth was because at the time, uh, all the wheat that was being grown in Minnesota was being sent down to Chicago. That was the main um, uh, port for shipping wheat, which would then be sent out to the east coast of Buffalo and uh, further down. Um, so the thought was that um, because Duluth, um, or, or excuse me, I need to back up here. In Chicago, the problem was a lot of the uh, flour and wheat producers were tired of Chicago having um, control over the prices for shipping. So what the uh, wheat producers in Minnesota thought 
was that if they built a railroad up to Duluth, they could have their own port where they can control prices. Another reason why Duluth became a target for development as a port was because further out west, there were plans for a railroad, the Northern Pacific, to be built out this direction. And North Dakota today is actually the, one of the larger producing wheat regions in the U.S. So um, it was known that once the railroad got out this direction, Duluth would be directly east of it for wheat shipments. So it'd be a perfect opportunity to take care or take advantage of wheat shipments going across um, from Duluth uh, to the rest of the Great Lakes. Another big uh, factor with the building of the canal was Jay Cook. Jay Cook was one of the uh, most richest people at the time uh, here in the U.S. He actually financed the Union, uh, the Northern states in the Civil War to help them win their fight against the Southern states. Um, he was a Philadelphia banker, so he was an investment banker. He made a lot of money off of his investments. Um, and he believed a lot in the railroads. He was very supportive of having railroads being built west uh, for economic development. So he actually invested money into that railroad we talked about, the Lake Superior, Mississippi, to finish their project to get up to Duluth. And, and he was also the main um, investor for the Northern Pacific going west, if anyone's familiar with railroad history. That's a, one of the three main transcontinental railroads that were first built in the late 1800s across the U.S. It was a huge effort. And then uh, because of his investment in the railroad, he eventually invested a lot of money into Duluth itself, uh, developing it as a port. And uh, he's very famous uh, being kind of one of the founders of Duluth here. Uh, he has a lot of statues around town, which you can, you can see him here. And uh, he has a state park nearby uh, named for him, Jake Cook State Park. So a lot of his money went to, again, developing the port. Initially, uh, the Duluth businessmen in the area built the port out on the open lake, not back here in the protected area, just because they thought it would be easier to access since there wasn't a way to get to the harbor. Um, the canal didn't exist yet. Um, and they had one of the first things, of course, they constructed was a grain elevator uh, for the wheat shipments, which they'd be loaded onto uh, the Great Lake ships that would show up. And then uh, they had a breakwater here that would protect the little outer harbor. But again, Jay Cook put in a lot of the money that went into building all this uh, huge investments. And then we get to the final and kind of final factor that led to the canal. So although they had the outer harbor built, a uh, problem with it was that it was um, even the breakwater out there couldn't protect the little port that was built from the lake. Lake Superior is notorious for really bad storms, which I'm sure Lake Ontario is as well. <clears throat> but with how big Lake Superior is, we get really bad storms when we have winds coming out of the northeast, um, where we'd have waves 15 or more feet. Um, even I've seen it, even at our visitor center, it's really destructive. Um, and as you can see, this outer harbor area is very unsafe for ships to load, even with the breakwater out there because of these huge waves that would come in. So uh, the developers in Duluth uh, looked to the harbor area and thought, well, maybe we'll revisit the idea of building a canal so that uh, Duluth had more of an access with a safer area inside the harbor behind my Minnesota Point for uh, development. And this, um, this picture is from this, uh, an infamous storm, 1872. And as you can see, it's still the same today. I took this picture in 2019. So it gets pretty crazy out there. <clears throat> now we're on to the digging of the canal. So Duluth was founded in 1870. Um, we had about 3,000 people that were now living here. Um, that was a huge jump from 14 families over, only a year earlier. And uh, as this hillside here um, was being populated, um, the city was founded and uh, the city founders decided that they would, one of the first projects they take on is digging a canal so that a better harbor could be developed. They used a, a steam dredge called the Ishpeming. Um, it basically ate uh, a, a path or a canal through this, the Minnesota Point and Minnesota Point is a sandbar, so it's actually easier for it to get through. And again, this is kind of what uh, those steam dredges looked at the time. It was basically just 
a steam shovel that was put on a barge. Um, it, it did take a long time and actually they were forced to stop digging. Um, they started in September um, and they weren't able to finish when winter set in. So they weren't quite done. Um, it wouldn't be able to be finished until the next year. <clears throat> So um, Superior, Wisconsin was already pissed uh, in a way uh, with Duluth, Minnesota because of the railroad. The fact that they got the railroad was um, bad for business interests um, that wanted that railroad to come to Superior so that they could develop their port and get more business. Um, so at the time, there was an infamous man um, that's famous in Wisconsin uh, named Washburn. Washburn was one of the early founders of General Mills, which is one of the larger wheat producing companies. So you could probably see here like wheat. Uh, he basically, um, although he was a politician, he had a lot of money wrapped up in uh, the wheat and flour producing industry. So basically on behalf of Superior Wisconsin, um, Washburn who was, I can't remember if he was the governor of Wisconsin at the time or one of the state senators, either way, he sent a letter to the what the engineers back then were called, which was um, that we were part, more part of the army at the time. And this is the letter he sent in September of 1870 when they started digging the canal. He sent a letter, as you can see, calling attention to a canal which was being cut across Minnesota Point near the harbor of Superior, Wisconsin, which if completed would, in his opinion, ruin the entrance to the harbor. Uh, the work upon the cut should be immediately stopped because a canal made across Minnesota Point would prove da seriously detrimental to navigate, navigate, like, excuse me, navigate, can't speak this evening, the entrance now approved upon by the United States. So what he's talking about is uh, the superior entry, which the U.S. government has already put in money to maintain. Um, and this is the letter he sent to the Army engineer. So this is kind of a visualization about um, what he was arguing and what the people of Superior, Wisconsin were arguing. So what they were saying here is if we build a canal um, or dig a canal to the lake, we would be allowing water from the St. Louis River to flow out to the lake here. And they thought, at least their argument, was that that would cause the natural entry to fill up with sand because of um, shifting of the river flow, um, which would keep the ships coming into their side of the harbor, which was uh, just inside here. And um, one of the things that they proposed that could fix this problem is that if they were to build a dike that would kind of uh, keep both harbors separate so that this wouldn't happen. So one of the questions um, that I would have posed, but I, I can't see the chat or anything, so I'm going to keep going, but think to yourselves, um, if the canal was built with the loose railroad connection in mind, what do you think will happen to Superior's business? Well, uh, like I said, um, that would be a huge problem. Um, Superior, in actuality, they don't, they're kind of making an argument that makes sense, but in actual actuality they're worried about competition with business so they're they're fearing uh that the loose canal uh would attract all the shipping business uh, to their side of the harbor instead of superior getting that business and they would lose a lot, a lot of money as a result and that's what washburn was also worried about because i'm sure he was invested in any business interests in the area so now we get to a famous part with the history of the canal here, which was there was a bunch of legends that came up uh, with this conflict about the canal being built. And uh, this is kind of a cool picture. This is the early construction that was going on at the time um, at the Duluth area. This is the outer harbor area that was being built uh, in 1870. So some other facts leading up to the legend. Um, so the government and the U.S. engineers, uh, the U.S. Army sided with Superior Wisconsin, thinking that they were probably right that this would be a problem. So once the uh, canal um, digging stopped over winter, um, <clears throat> basically that is when uh, the Army kind of calls to have uh, their local uh, engineers there to keep an eye on the uh, canal construction. When it started again, um, they would send an injunction order 
to Duluth to, to stop the construction. At the time, that was General Andrew Humphreys, who was the head of the U.S. Army at the time. And of course, uh, digging did start again in that spring. And uh, just for all those uh, know what an injunction order is, it's a court order requiring a person or city in this case to stop doing something. So this is a legal way of getting the city to stop the construction. So this is kind of a part of the presentation where um, this is more of an educational part about legends. Um, and of course, just to give you kind of a, a definition here, that's a story that is believed and that is told by a real person, event, or place. And legends, especially with local history, which I'm sure you guys are aware of, um, I'm sure you have your own local legends there. Um, these, this is kind of the way that they develop. Um, they're, uh, the reason why they become so popular and they kind of take over for fact is because they're simple, meaning they're easy to understand unexpected so that they grab people's attention. They're easy to remember. They're short. They're, um, they seem somewhat believable. Um, and they can be emotional and dramatic to help people see the importance. And uh, they're a story. They're a good story. A lot of people, we as humans love storytelling. So, um, so this would have been a part of the presentation where if I was able to have access to see um, people answering, I would have asked, so which one of these stories do you think was uh, what actually happened versus the legends? I include two legends that, that were told at the time. Um, one of the legends here is warned that the injunction would arrive in a few days time. Duluth city leaders ordered every man, woman, and child who could handle a shovel to help dig the canal and finish it before the injunction arrives. A soldier from St. Paul has to deliver it arrives just as the first boat, boat travels through. So as you can see, um, that's very exciting, very dramatic. So you might be able to recognize, oh, that sounds like a legend. That doesn't sound like that actually happened. <clears throat> Number two here, uh, the steam dredger Ishpeming encountered some frozen gravel just before reaching the lake. Workers were ordered to shovel and blast through the gravel to help finish the canal and the injunction order arrived a week after the canal reached the lake. So um, that is uh, what actually happened. So there was actually not, um, there was a rush to uh, finish the canal before the injunction order shows up. Um, but in reality, it wasn't dug by every man, woman and child in Duluth. It wasn't that dramatic. Um, and then number three, another local legend about it is more than the injunction order will arrive the next day. Duluth businesses go out in secret to finish digging the canal overnight. Now, can you believe um, men with money at the time would do something like this? I don't. They would have paid someone to do it, not themselves. <clears throat> As morning approached, uh, they called for dynamite to speed the process. The blast broke every window in Duluth, which I feel like every local town has a has some kind of legend about every window breaking from some blast, but the canal reached the lake in time. Uh, like I said, number two and three are legends uh, told about the finishing in the canal, and number two here is what actually happened. <clears throat> Either way, the Duluth uh, businessmen and the city um, did what they could to get it done uh, before the injunction order came so that there couldn't be anything done about it. And they did have warning because like back then communication um, or traveling took a lot uh, longer than communication. So they got wind of that injunction order coming and they made sure that it was finished. So how the heck did a legend form like this? Well, uh, the legends formed many years later, kind of as Duluth's port and importance grew. So as the city leaders went on to write histories about the development of the city, they wanted the history and the building of the canal to become more important. So they created more of a faction or a fictional um, story rather than fact. Um, and it was believed at the time that Duluth would become the next Chicago of the Great Lakes, meaning one of the bigger city centers. So they had to create a dramatic tale uh, for its for the founding for the building of the canal. And then um, the canal itself, like I said, uh, was finished in April 30th, 1871. And that's when the first uh, small boat passed through um, that same day. And uh, this is kind of give you guys an example of the shipping um, that how that has changed over the years. So 
Uh, this uh, ship that we saw in an earlier photo, the Steamer Norman, which was a passenger and package freight vessel built in 1863, that was the first larger commercial vessel um, that went through in 1871 uh, when the canal was finished, only 137 feet long. This is the largest ship that comes through the canal today. We get a thousand foot ships that come through. This is the Paul Archer Gertha. And uh, that, this one comes through pretty regularly uh, for coal shipments. It's 1,013 feet long. Uh, so it actually just stays here on the Great Lakes because to get through the Welland Canal, you need 740 feet or less and the thousand footers are too big uh, to fit through. So, um, the conflict wasn't over. Um, even though Duluth finished the canal, uh, Superior still wanted um, a solution. They were very mad about it uh, because again, they didn't want competition for business. So uh, the Duluth attorney at the time, James G. Egan made a deal with the US Army that they would build that dike that I told you about to separate the two harbors, which you can see on the right. And that basically was supposed to uh, keep Superior happy um, that their entry would not fill in um, from this new canal that was built on the other side of the harbor. This is what the dike looked like. Um, it was pretty primitive. They uh, Railroad workers used anything they could to make it. Uh, the harbor was about uh, 6 to 12 feet deep at the time, so they had to pour in a lot of material to make this artificial uh, separation. Superior it was over here and Duluth and the canal was that direction. So this this actually doesn't fix the problem. Superior actually gets uh, mad again um, calling for the canal to be filled um, and they're also mad about the dike now because they're mad that they don't have access to the Duluth side of the, of the harbor um, which <laughs> it's a uh, I don't, I don't know how else to describe it, but it was basically silly. They were just mad about um, the business competition. So um, to appease Superior so that they wouldn't get um, the U.S. government to uh, fill in the canal, uh, the Northern Pacific Railroad president at the time, which is that railroad being built west from there, uh, made a deal with Governor Washburn that he would have the Northern Pacific be built to Superior so that they would be happy and they would have access to the railroad, which is what they wanted initially. But that still doesn't end the argument. The argument goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in the US here. And um, eventually it was put to rest uh, in 1877, which this is six years after the canal was built. Uh, Superior was still mad about it. <clears throat> But this judge that's uh, seen here, Justice uh, S.F. Miller, uh, was the one who um, basically argued that the U.S. government by that time had already put in money to maintain the Duluth Ship Canal, so they're not, they're not going to take it out. So that put an end to it. All right, uh, now we're kind of getting to the final uh, portion of the presentation here. Uh, now I'm going to be talking about where my organization comes in, the Army Corps of Engineers, how we basically uh, got hold of the canal to maintain it, and uh, what's happened since then. So this is what it looks like out in front of our visitor center. You're literally right next to the ships when they come through. <clears throat> That's one of the uh, thousand footers, the Edwin H. Scott, going through the canal there uh, one or two years ago. So they, it, they, they just look huge, and it's really cool to see up close. So uh, in 1873, we had another major recession here in the U.S. Um, that actually caused uh, Jay Cook to go bankrupt. He was the richest man at the time, um, and he lost a lot of money in the recession. And as a result, everything he invested in also lost money. So Duluth all of a sudden found itself in trouble. It didn't have a money source anymore for development. So at this point, uh, the Duluth, uh, the city government didn't have an, enough money to maintain the canal. So uh, the government took over and that's where the engineers came in. And initially <clears throat> the Duluth ship canal, which you can see kind of in the middle here, had very primitive wooden piers that were built um, a thousand or so feet out into the lake to protect both sides of it so that the, the canal wouldn't fill in. 
uh, with sand. And here you can see one of those primitive wooden piers that were in, that was initially built. Um, they became a problem <clears throat> because they were built of wood and there was problems with ice out on Lake Superior every winter. And this the ice would actually damage these structures. So the engineers spent a lot of time and money uh, fixing them. And here's another early uh, look at uh, the canal um, with a schooner coming through uh, being towed by a steam tug. Um, at the time, the canal had two lighthouses, one on the very end. You can barely see it back here, a primitive wooden lighthouse. There was one further back here to kind of allow mariners to see where the canal was located. So eventually the engineers, uh, because of how the port was developing and because of the annoyance with the wooden piers, they decided to make some major adjustments to it. <clears throat> and uh, they were initially the piers, which you can see here, um, they were going to make the canal 100 feet wider and much longer. And the, it was gonna be built of concrete. This was a huge project. Um, I believe uh, the U.S. government at, at the time put in $600,000, uh, which would be a ton of money today <clears throat> for the construction of the piers here. And this gentleman on the right, he is the one who was uh, the one who designed the piers and um, had uh, did the work to get the money uh, to have this done. When the piers were constructed, uh, what was kind of interesting was they actually have they had a tunnel uh, built into them in the middle. And the reason for this tunnel was so that uh, a lighthouse keeper could take <clears throat> basically a small little um, cart uh, all the way out to the lighthouse at the end of the pier. The pier is, you know, 1400 feet long. And uh, during bad storms, the pier would actually be unsafe with water getting up on uh, to the pier. So this tunnel was going to be for the lighthouse keepers to get out to their lighthouses. Well, it ended up being that they went, the the seal for these tunnels wasn't great, so they would actually flood during storms. So it didn't work out. It was a cool idea. Um, the tunnels are still down there today, uh, but they're filled in. And this picture on the right here uh, was taken in the 1950s uh, when they were doing some work down there. And I would personally be really claustrophobic as a, if I was a lighthouse keeper trying to get down to the lighthouse. But some uh, pictures of the construction in the late 1890s. Uh, the concrete portion of the piers was completed in 1902, and <clears throat> it, it required hundreds of workers and lots of work. But those piers still exist today. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, just before the construction began, there was actually a shipwreck that was right next to the canal that needed to be removed. Uh, we actually have artifacts from this shipwreck at our museum. Uh, it was a schooner that actually missed uh, the entrance and crashed, um, grounded on shore. So the Corps of Engineers ended up uh, blowing it up to get it out of the way for construction. But it's just kind of a neat little interesting fact um, for those uh, local here in the Duluth area. Um, another little interesting tidbit with the piers, um, there was a famous uh, army captain who uh, studied wave science at the canal. He had this mosaic uh, put on the very end of the piers so that he could stand out there and write down observations on wave heights. Um, his name was uh, Captain Gallard. He was actually one of the uh, major designers for the Panama Canal, the U.S. portion of it. So he was pretty famous later on, but uh, he actually wrote a authoritative book on uh, wave action because of his studies there, which is pretty interesting. Uh, this mosaic was um, up on the piers until the 80s. Uh, when the piers were rebuilt, this was actually all taken down. So we actually have portions of it in our collection still uh, from 1902 when it was put up. Uh, 1902, when the canal was finished, was actually when we had the most vessel transits uh, coming into the harbor. We had, as you can see here, 4,270 commercial vessels uh, departed through the canal with 9.1 million tons of cargo. So 
<clears throat> amazing amount of ships that came through. Um, we had all sorts of cargoes, not just iron ore, coal, and wheat, but also lumber, uh, flour, uh, any anything you could think of. Um, Minnesota was a major place for uh, natural resources being uh, shipped from here uh, east down through the Great Lakes. To give you kind of a comparison, uh, in 2019, we had 530 commercial vessels depart through the canal, and but that actually equated to about 29.1 million tons of cargo uh, th those ships carried. So since 1902, the ships have gotten bigger, but fewer in number. Uh, and because they've gotten bigger, they can carry more cargo compared to the ships of the day. And uh, this ship that's coming through the canal uh, there is one of the U.S. Steel Pittsburgh Steamship Company uh, ships. I believe it's the Howard Shaw um, coming through the early canal. Uh, the lighthouse here at the end is still there. Um, that's the South Pier Outer Breakwater Light. And uh, the Northern Pier Lighthouse would be later built uh, right here at the very end. And ever since the uh, early 1900s, the canal has been a major tourist attraction uh, here in Duluth, and it's still that way today. Our visitor center gets 500,000 uh, visitors uh, annually on average. Um, so it's crazy about the amount of people that come to visit. And then finally, the Duluth area lift bridge was famously first constructed in 1905 across the canal. And that was mainly so that residents could get across to Park Point. Now that the canal was there, um, residents needed a way to get across. So. <clears throat> It was initially built as a gondola bridge where a gondola ferry would be connected to the frame and via an electric motor, they'd be able to bring it across back and forth with people on board. Um, it was actually designed after a bridge that was located in France of the same type. So it was pretty cool. It was the first bridge of its kind in the US at the time. Uh, an infamous thing that happened at the uh, canal was the uh, uh, accident with the steamer Matafa. Uh, the Matafa storm is infamous here in Lake Superior. It's one of the worst storms uh, for shipwrecks. It, it happened in 1905. During that storm, uh, the steamer Matafa actually ran into the North Pier here and uh, became stranded out there um, without the crew members a being able to get off. Unfortunately, a bunch of them died and froze to death during this infamous storm. Uh, because this was late November 1905, so the temperatures actually dropped during this major storm. And here you can see the Matafa after it crashed, uh, trying to get into the harbor. It was turned around by the lake, and it settled um, off to the left of the canal. And uh, that's where the crew were forced to stay overnight. Um, the crew up in the pilot house survived, but the crew back here unfortunately froze to death because of this. It was a really bad storm. Because of um, how infamous this event was, the storm, the storm was uh, named after this ship, even though there were about uh, 20 other ships, 30 other ships that crashed during the storm. This was the worst of the accidents. Then we get to uh, 1953. That was the most cargo that was handled through the canal. About 70 million tons of cargo was moved through that year, uh, mostly due to high demand for iron ore in the steel industry to fight uh, the Korean War. <clears throat> and uh, 5,704 commercial vessels came through. Uh, again, to make a comparison for 2019, uh, we had about 754 commercial vessels come through that year with 30.4 million tons of cargo. So uh, 1953 was a huge year. It was the most cargo handled. Then finally, we get to the modern canal. The modern canal was kind of done in the 1980s. The original 1902 piers, uh, they actually had to put a concrete cap on top of it because they were kind of falling apart. Uh, so the uh, piers themselves uh, became a lot wider and a lot more modern. So this is what the uh, piers look like today uh, with the ships coming through. Um, but the old tunnel is still down there. So I think that's pretty cool that that's there. And uh, some size dimensions for you all to get a sense of how big it is. Again, it's about 300 feet wide. Um, 
uh, the largest thousand foot ships are about 105 feet wide. So they take up about a third of the canal when they come through. Uh, it's about the size of an American football field, to give you a sense. Uh, the piers are about 1,600 feet long, so that it's a pretty long walk. I get some decent exercise when I'm kind of doing my um, checks on the park area. And if you were to take uh, the new um, World Trade Center tower in New York City, um, that would be about the same um, the height of it would be about the same as how long the piers are to give you a kind of a sense of how huge and long uh, the Duluth Ship Canal is. And then the, the uh, channels in the harbor are kept at about 30 feet. So that's how deep. And uh, the vessels uh, will load to a foot or two of the bottom uh, when they're carrying cargoes. And that kind of concludes the uh, presentation. Uh, here are some of my sources. Uh, if anyone's interested, um, I could send out some more information. Um, and then if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. I'll be here for a little bit. Um, and thank you all for uh, coming to watch the presentation today. Looking for more great content like this? Why not check out the Oakville Historical Society website YouTube channel, or Facebook and Instagram pages.